In September 2021, I cycled over a thousand kilometers around Iceland with my friend Rob Small. Rob, who is a professional diver, took this opportunity to visit Silfra and dive in between the tectonic plates that split Iceland apart between North America and Europe. We recorded the dive on an iPhone 12 in Dolby Vision HDR in depths and conditions that far exceeded the manufacturer's specifications. This is Rob's recollection of the day that ticked a big box in his bucket list. So, if you want to see more from our adventure, then please subscribe to my channel and get those notifications for when those new films are coming out. Tell me what your past experience is as a, as a diver. 22-ish years thereabouts diving. About 21 of them may be professional, give or take. Um, I'm lucky enough to turn that into a career for my whole life. I'm about 5,000 dives in, there or thereabouts. Um, I don't dive so much anymore. Well, that's okay. You know, I've, I've, I've seen quite a lot. And lucky enough to to tip it off right at the end with, with a, a dive that's on my bucket list and on many divers' bucket lists. And, and what, what is that bucket list dive for you and many of your professional and amateur colleagues? The bucket list consists of normally the same three or four dives anywhere in the world. When you first start diving, you want to see sharks and big things in the warm waters. So the Maldives is on your list. I've been there, I'm lucky enough. South Pacific, I've been there as well. Um, Scapa Flow in Scotland because the wrecks, it's where I started diving, I've been there. But the one that sits there above the rest for a lot of divers is a place called Silfra in Iceland. And that's where we went, obviously. And it's probably so famous because of two main reasons. One, it's the only place on the planet where you can sit between two tectonic plates and you can touch North America with one hand and Europe with the other. But the second thing is the visibility. It is so unbelievably clear that it's probably the closest you're going to feel like flying that you're, you're ever going to get. And even you dive in great visibility, but when the visibility is essentially endless, the feeling you get is completely different. Yeah, I must admit when you first told me about it as a non-diver, I immediately went on YouTube and, and saw some incredible videos and was blown away and I thought well we're gonna be we're gonna be in the area literally we're gonna be cycling past it and it was certainly an opportunity that we could not miss um, but but could you tell me a little bit about uh, you we, we had a dive buddy or you had a dive buddy um, and wh why is that important what why why did you need him so I was lucky enough to dive with ants who was our guide slash my dive buddy when I was there. And I think buddies, there's a couple of reasons why you need a dive buddy. There's a few of them. And this exact circumstance, um, simply because it had so many dives, you could have an argument for not having one. But the biggest reason for a dive buddy in a location like this is knowledge. It doesn't matter how many dives I have, I do not have the location knowledge that ants had the knowledge of the small little pockets that exist on the dive site of, you know, around this corner of this to see and so on. So having a buddy there on that dive site is, is very important because if I go on my own, the dive buddy is safety. At the end of the day, we're underwater. All of our equipment is self-contained on our bodies. And if something goes wrong while you're down there, then the source of oxygen that you need will be the buddy next to you. So if something fails with my system, I would then turn to Ants, who would then give me his regulator and I could then breathe off of his system, and vice versa. So without that buddy, we're essentially losing uh, the safety aspect of, of diving. And that's the same with any dive, I guess. That's the same with any dive. Anywhere in the world you go, um, they will not make you. It, it's not made, although it is enforced in a lot of places. It's when you do your courses you learn that this is the safest and smartest way to dive and it's more fun with another person you can do extended courses that allows you to dive on your own and you learn how to become self-sufficient basically what that means is you carry a, a secondary smaller system 
that you'd attach to yourself. So if your one was to fail, you would turn to this bailout system and then surface. But in general, diving is more fun, you know, with another person. So why would you want to try and eliminate that part as well? And, and you were wearing something called a dry suit. And so why did you need it? And what was your past experience wearing such a thing? So the two main... The two main systems in diving for exposure is a wetsuit and a dry suit. And exactly how they sound is how they work. A wetsuit keeps you warm by trapping water next to your body that your body heats, so essentially you're diving inside a small layer of warm water. A dry suit keeps you dry, dry by blocking out the water. So basically, uh, the cold water from the outside hits the suit. Between the suit and your skin, there's a big fluffy duvet of want of a better word, and that cold water can't penetrate you. Eventually the cold on the suit will penetrate through, but it gives you a lot longer time underwater before it becomes a problem. The issue is that you have to do a whole set of courses or course to learn how to drive in a dry suit, because dry suit, the feeling is completely different. I personally love it, because you have air from your toes all the way to your neck, you can feel the squeezes, you diving feels a lot more technical you feel the pressure you feel what's going on more in a in a dry suit and i quite enjoy that because i, I sorry rob because, because i noticed there were bubbles coming from your suit what was that so, about because we've created an airspace within the suit so as i go down pressure increases these air spaces get smaller and because i have an airspace in my suit that means this airspace is getting small, smaller. So we get what's called a squeeze. So everything gets really tight. And as a guy, an area that squeezes, you know about real quick. So in order to, to alleviate that, we have a little button on our chest. And when you press it, it takes air from the cylinder and puts it into the suit that gets rid of that squeeze and adds to your buoyancy. Now the problem is, is when you ascend and the pressure becomes less, this air expands. And if it expands too quick, in the suit, you would go up too fast. So you have to let out some of that air in order to maintain your buoyancy. And that's that small bubbles you see coming out of normally the shoulder or a cuff dump. Um, if we've came up slightly and expanded and I feel I was going up too much or Ants was, we dump some of that air out. So it wasn't a fault, it was on purpose, I promise. And what were your first impressions when your head went underwater? You know what a dive site's gonna be like. You know what, if I jump in the Maldives, even if I haven't been in, I'm going to see fish, it's warm. And I know what Silphro was going to be like, because I'd seen the videos, and it's going to be clear. But for some reason, that there's a disconnect from what I saw and what I experienced, and it was just... It was overwhelming. It was... <gasps> you took a breath, and that could have been the cold hitting my face as well, what maybe added to it, but... It's, it's so hard to put into words this endless visibility, this crystal clear nothingness and the floating and the, all the memories coming back of the dry suit because that was the first time I'd been in one in almost 20 years or something. And so wh why is the water so clear then? Uh, there's a mixture of answers there. Uh, colder water tends to be clearer anyway. And then you'll get what's called a thermocline, which is the, the difference in temperatures in the water where it gets a bit murky. But the water in sulfur is so clear because it's essentially volcanic filtered. I think the sulfur water comes from, I'm not going to try and pronounce the, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce the, the glacier's name because I can't remember what it is. But the sulfur water comes from the largest uh, glacier in, in Iceland. And that water is just mass filtered through this volcanic rock. So by the time it gets there, it's essentially so pure that you could take your regulator out, you could drink it, uh, and there's very little particles. And at that temperature, there's very little life in it as well. So the clarity is, is off the chart. It's, it's mesmerizing. It's like being in a swimming pool. For you, what was the, the real wow factor? Was it the clarity of the water, or was it when you were able to physically touch North America and Europe on the tectonic plate. I think for me the, the most wowing factor was the visibility. And I know that maybe goes against it because the idea of touching two 
continents, if you will, is you can't do that anywhere else. And that's that's cool and that's different. But if you can be 5,000 dives in and still get in the water and be blown away by one of the the basics that happen when you dive, what you can see, that's amazing. That's that's a strong dive site to do that yeah. after so many times. And it's you could lie there and look around. And it didn't matter what you were seeing because the clarity was so overwhelming that it was just nice being able to see that far. I don't know if that makes sense. Or maybe you don't yeah. get it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I wasn't in the water. So as, as someone that's, I mean, I'm really into geology. So perhaps touching the tectonic plate would have been, but I, I can't say because I'm not a diver. Um, but actually, talking about that, you don't necessarily need to be a diver to experience what you experience because indeed there were snorkelers hovering above you could, could you tell me about perhaps those that could go and snorkel it is it something that anyone could pretty much do i mean what, what what's your take on that i think they're very lucky on that dive site that they worked out and they allowed the fact that although a diving experience there is is spectacular you don't actually have to go diving to experience what i saw you could quite easily snorkel with next to zero experience and have the visibility and the plates and the whole feeling that I had 90% of it. That last 10% of being submerged and weightless, you will only get diving. But if you could experience 90% of what I had without having to go through all the training and just turn up, put the equipment on and jump in, then I don't know why anybody who visits Iceland wouldn't seek that out because it's it's not something you can do somewhere else. So anyone that's reasonably fit, who who likes water, but who likes snorkeling with with perhaps a little bit of experience snorkeling, could, could quite easily go and do it. Then it's not a it's not a specialist version of snorkeling. Then not at all. It's open to everyone, and if anything, it could actually be easier than other snorkeling because they yeah. will also put you in the same dry suit as I had on without the ability to add the air, but you're closed in a system that makes you unsinkable. You're one big bubble, so you cannot sink. So in essence, it's maybe easier than other snorkeling. You know, as long as you've worked out that you have to breathe through your mouth through the snorkel and look down, that's it. There's nothing else to do. You will float there quite easily. And, and how long, I don't remember, how, how long were you actually in the water for then? Uh, I think I was in the water for about 45 minutes, but I cheated very slightly. So we first went in and we did what's called a weight check to make sure we were okay, and that took one minute only. And then we did the dive uh, and we, we checked the equipment and we came up. And I very loosely, jokingly said to Ants, oh, that was amazing, I'd love to go around again. <laughs> he looked at me and went, really? I went, yeah, and he goes, okay, let's go. So we went back in and did another maybe 10 minute loop. So I was, I was lucky that I had a buddy who, even after all of his dives, was still wowed by the dive site so much that he turned around and went straight back in with me, basically because of my excitement. So I think all in was probably around just under an hour. Um, but the cold controls it, you start to get quite numb and lose feeling in your lips and your, your hands because your hands aren't dry, they're in wet gloves. So I, I think that's definitely the by far the limit where you'd want to come out and, and get a bit warm before you went back in again. So even with all the dry suit and the layers and everything, it was cold then? Cold still getting to you. It's, you know, the shock when you jump in is there and it's extreme and then you get used to it. But very slowly that cold is eating away at you. It's like a big, it, it's like a an hourglass that you turn. You know, right. you have a certain amount of time before that cold's gonna get you. And if you're lucky, it's longer than others. But once it gets you, you gotta get out. And um, we, we recorded the entire sequence on the iPhone 12 in Dolby Vision HDR. It was a risk because we were essentially, potentially sabotaging one of our phones because the specifications that we pushed the phone were far greater than, than Apple had suggested the cold, the duration and the depth primarily. When we came out and we played the footage directly from the device, what did you think? Does it look like what you saw? The worry of that whole sequence was I was I was really nervous of, of taking the camera underwater and expecting it to live 
uh, and knowing we had one shot at it. Well, sorry, it, Rob, it wasn't a camera, it was a phone. I mean, it's, it wasn't... No, well, it says it all. Absolute habit of going under the water and saying the word camera. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, taking a phone underwater and knowing there was one shot and, and this was it, and if it failed, that, you know, that whole sequence was gone. So in amongst your euphoria of what I was doing was, was that nerve. So when we came up, and because I had all the equipment on, I've got no dexterity, I, I've got no functionality in my fingers, so I handed the camera up to you. And the first thing I heard was just the noise that you made, because obviously you were looking at it, and I think you were going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And then I started smiling, and you know, we, we clambered out with ants, and we had a look, and then I was going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I think the first oh my goodness was that the phone was still working, and the second yeah. one was, it looked what I was seeing, the clarity came through completely on the phone, the yeah. sound came through on the phone, which is something I wasn't sure was, was going to come through the same. The, the, the bubble noise and everything. and It's nice because now I get to relive that dive whenever I like, either on my phone or I, I put it on the TV or however I want to watch it. Because the phone that you have in your pocket was one of the phones that we were given to go and make, exactly. these, make this project. That's why. You, you've blagged that phone and kept it. And, and, th and, th and that footage is is still that original footage is on yep. that phone that is in your pocket that you're probably using this moment to, to film this this chat the, exactly i i, I haven't deleted the original no. the original take from it i i don't want to no. and i couldn't but i want full experience of it i run a cold bath and i lie in a cold bath and watch it for a while and see how see how long i can last I, i'm still i'm still i'm still blown away that the, the we, we captured the entire dive sequence on a mobile phone uh, to depths well exceeding the manufacturer's recommendation. The, the depths and times that were past the manufacturer's recommendation and then used the same phone for the rest yeah. of the trip to capture all the other footage that we, we ended up doing as well. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, talk about longevity. So my final question is, is I mean, it's a bit of a stupid question, really. I mean, but did it meet your expectations? Or did it, you know, will it be something that you'll always, always remember? When you have a good experience with anything, you always look back through rose-tinted glasses or even a bad experience. And the dive, singular on its own, will, will live in my memory forever. That's, that's not going. And I, again, lucky enough that I can tap into that memory and the physical presence of it any time I like and it's it was what I expected and exceeded it 20 times over uh, and I have to reiterate if you're in Iceland whether you're a diver or not you have to seek Silfra out and if you can go diving if you're a diver go snorkeling if you're a snorkeler because it will give you an experience that is going to last way beyond your actual holiday. It will be there forever. Well, on that note, Rob, thank you very much for your time. And um, it, it's ironic that it was tomorrow, a year ago, that, that we were leaving for Iceland. But I think the adventure is still living on. So thank you very much. And, oh, and thank you for your time, mate. Nice yeah, to talk to you again. Brilliant. Hope you're well. Cheers, mate. Take care, buddy. Bye. Bye. You still there, Rob? Yeah, man.